Let's begin our service by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God. But especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray together for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. Thank you. 
We're going to be looking at three men in the New Testament that would be good for us to imitate. I'm talking about Timothy, Epaphroditus, and the Apostle St. Paul in today's reading. So let's pray before we begin. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we are continuing our study in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. We're up to part 8. So let's look at Timothy first. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him, who will be generally concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Well, so far, not much to go on. So we're going to have to fill in the blanks a bit. Timothy is mentioned 25 times in the New Testament. And as you know, two of the Apostle Paul's letter are addressed to him personally. He was a son of a mixed marriage. His mother instructed him in the scriptures, was Jewish, and his father was Greek. We're not exactly sure when Timothy became a Christian, but apparently the Apostle Paul was deeply impressed by him. The young Timothy was evidently pretty shy. We know this because Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, encourages the church to put his mind at ease. Look again at the passage. The poor we get of Timothy, although not a lot to go on, still gives us some food for thought. One commentator says this, It's interesting that Paul doesn't say Timothy is a wonderful teacher or preacher. Timothy, or, you know, Timothy is very devout. He's a holy man. But, Paul says, he will be generally concerned for your welfare. In other words, he's going to take care of you. He is a true pastor. The implication is that Timothy is operating out of a very unselfish motive, a real true love for people. Paul contrasts Timothy favorably with others whom he doesn't name as people who are only looking out for themselves. Not a very nice picture. But of course, Timothy is different. It's interesting that when Paul says, verse 21, that Timothy is looking after the interests of Jesus Christ and that he's also looking after the interests of people in the church, for Paul, these are basically two ways of saying the same thing. He looks after the interests of Jesus. He looks after the interests of people. It reminds me of what Jesus said of the kinds of people who will inherit eternal life. When Jesus tells that story, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry, or feed, or, or, or saw you thirsty, or give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked you, or in clothing? And when do we see you in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. I think the most significant part is verse 22, where it says that Paul and Timothy have worked together like father and son. And that's quite appropriate uh, seeing that uh, this coming weekend is Father's Day. When this was written, most sons would follow in the footsteps of their fathers and family occupations. Think of the disciples of Jesus who were fishermen 
and their fathers were fishermen, and so on, sometimes going back many, many generations. A son would learn the trade by watching and imitating his father. The passage tells us that's how Paul saw Timothy. He trusts Timothy to act as he would himself, like a, a true son. Actually, it's even more intense than that, because Paul says, verse 22, that you know Timothy's proven worth, how a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. And the word served is actually a lot stronger. So he served with me, slaved with me. We were co-slaves. Now, putting aside our you know, repulsion to the word slavery for a moment, the idea of slavery introduces and at the same time sums up Paul's attitude towards Jesus. Paul considered himself a slave, a servant to Jesus. He wanted to serve and obey Jesus as master. How so? First of all, Paul had a whatever happens attitude. Paul was submissive to the Lord's ordering of his life. Verse 24 says, I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. In a very understated way, Paul is basically saying whether he lives as a prisoner or as a free man, or whether Paul lives or dies, he is trusting in the Lord. Now again, remember, Paul's writing this from prison. I suppose he could have said something like, well, I'm trusting in the justice system of Rome, uh, Roman law, and I'm going to be released because I, I didn't do anything wrong. Or he could have said, don't you know who I am? I'm a Roman citizen. They can't keep me. But he doesn't say that. Paul puts his life in God's hands. He held on to the belief that he served a sovereign God. God rules all things. Freedom, prison, discomfort, sickness, health. Paul had a whatever happens attitude. He knew, he knew he was in the Lord's hands. Secondly, it meant that Paul and Timothy both committed themselves to very active service. Verse 24, he had served me in the gospel. It could be read as he slave with me in the gospel. Just as we discover earlier in chapter 2 that Jesus himself took the form of a slave. As difficult as it is for us to get our heads around this incredible challenging attitude all of us are called to the very same thing. Remember earlier in the chapter, have this mind, the mind of Jesus, the mind of a servant, the mind of someone who went to the cross because he loved us so much. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And thirdly, how else did Paul consider himself a slave to Jesus. It worked itself out in his self-giving attitude towards, of course, his brothers and sisters in the church. Paul saw his friends in Philippi as worthy of the best he could give them. And he sent Timothy, who was very, very dear to him, who in his words, there's no one like him. So we get a glimpse into Paul's character and Timothy. Timothy is a very interesting guy. And the sense here is that Timothy actually worried. He worried about these people, his brothers and sisters in the church. It consumed his mind. St. Paul, Paul did exactly the same thing. Timothy learned well from his spiritual father. And of course, the whole point is that in essence, we can learn. We can learn from their example as well. We can imitate them. Paul and Timothy, putting the Lord first by seeking the spiritual good of other people through a sacrificial gospel ministry. To say the least, the Apostle Paul is proud, quote, of his son, Timothy, because he is a servant of the Lord. 
So what can we learn from the passage so far? Well, what we can learn from Timothy, who in the Bible is described as very affectionate, but sometimes very fearful, needing encouragement at times, but not ashamed of the gospel. Very, very simple, folks. God works through imperfect people. A friend of mine had to go through a psychological test when applying for a new job. And after the test, he said, well, if an uptight, anxious, not having much confidence in himself individual is what you're looking for, I'm your man. Sometimes sounds a bit like uh, Timothy, whose weaknesses are as apparent as his virtues. God loves to work through weak people. The whole Bible is filled with those kind of folks. And that is a, very much an encouragement to me, and I hope to you as well. Let's look at Epaphroditus. Now, we even have less to work with. Epaphroditus is only mentioned twice in the Bible, here and then later on in Philippians chapter 4. He was a Christian from Philippi. His name actually means charming. We also know that Epaphroditus brought a gift from the church to Paul all the way to Rome when he was in prison. So we get a glimpse into the character of this fine man. At the same time, just as the passage describing Timothy, we get a glimpse of Paul too. Now we're looking at the passage that describes Epaphroditus. So let's look at both Paul and Epaphroditus. First of all, Epaphroditus. Just from the passage, we see Paul describe him as my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, your messenger, minister to Paul's needs, and he has been longing for the church. Even in that, it is quite a description of his character. And then verse 30, he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life for the sake of Paul and the gospel. Pretty impressive. I find it also interesting that we see more into the character of St. Paul through this passage as well. Notice that Paul says that Epaphroditus nearly died when he was so sick, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on Paul also, lest he should have sorrow upon sorrow. Paul, in other words, would have been absolutely filled with grief for his dear friend Epaphroditus. Now, hold it a second. Didn't Paul also write in the very same letter to rejoice at all times? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say it, rejoice. Paul, don't you have enough faith that if Epaphroditus had died, he would have been with his Lord, enjoying God's presence forever? Where's your faith, Paul? And then Paul admits that he is very anxious. Again, Paul, didn't you already... Also write, do not be anxious about anything instead, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which suppress, suppresses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Again, in the very same letter to the Philippians, he's anxious. Isn't he got enough faith in prayer that God will give him peace? Here's my point. Simply, faith in Jesus does not erase the fact that we are human beings. We're not robots. We have emotions. Life is filled with all kinds of situations, sometimes terrible ones, that remind us that we are very, very human. The Bible is filled with all kind of real emotions. Paul is not afraid to admit his vulnerability. In my mind, it only makes him more real, more to be admired. In fact, we all want to be more like Timothy, Epaphroditus, and the Apostle St. Paul. But the real focus, of course, draws us back to Jesus. 
Because these three men had their minds, their hearts, their eyes fixed on the example of Jesus Christ. The work of God had been at in these men. The power of the Holy Spirit was enabling them to become more selfless, more determined, more of a servant of God and other people, all because of Jesus, who was their model. They were all very different, just as we are all very different. But we have the same Lord Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is right here with us as we gather in his name, challenging us, transforming us more and more into his image. So let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for my friends gathered today around your word, around prayer. And now, Lord, we invite the power of the Holy Spirit right now, Lord, to fill us once again with your presence, with your goodness, with your truth, Lord, with the power to change us more like Jesus. Lord, we bless you and we invite the Holy Trinity of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.